Welcome to A Course of Miracles. Tonight we're doing text chapter 11, God or the Ego. And we're doing section 11.4, From Darkness to Light. Again, a reminder, the acknowledgement of the Christ in our mind is that which is speaking the words of the Christ mind to us in these teachings brought through to Helen Schuchman and realize that what we're reading is not new to us. It's just the, the, the knowledge which comes directly from our source is being exposed. And that's really what's happening to us as we're moving from darkness of the dream to the light of awareness of the Christ mind in God as the extension of God. And so let's acknowledge the presence of the Christ with us and realize that it's being we're, we, the dreamer, the decision maker is being addressed and we're being asked to see a new, see a new way of understanding ourself, understanding our dream, knowing our divine self, our Christ, the divine self, knowing that we are that which is the son of God dreaming, fractured in 8 billion localized body minds and seen individually through what we call our own mind, which is just our localization of an activity in the dream and through our own, what seems to be personal awakening, we contribute to the Christ mind's collective awakening. And for each one of us that awakens into the Christ mind, a little bit more of the dream is lit and the darkness fades into a nothingness. And it has such a beautiful way of addressing us. And it's and it just the acknowledgement of the Christ that as seekers, seekers of the truth, seekers of happiness, because that's what we're really, what got us going in the search. We started seeking because we wanted to be happy. Um, and obviously, as we travel through this life, um, we become weary and we become tired and we become despondent. And he says to us, Christ says to us, when you are weary, remember you have hurt yourself. That's why you're feeling tired, because that which is light, that which is the son of God, cannot suffer, cannot be tired, because you're the immortal, eternal, ever shining light of God your comforter, and the comforter is the Holy Spirit, will rest you, but you cannot. So on our own, we can do nothing. You do not know how, for if you did, you could never have grown weary. And we've grown weary because we've misunderstood what we are, or what we think we are. Unless you hurt yourself, you could never suffer in any way, for that is not God's will for his son, and we are the son. Pain is not of him, for he knows no attack, and his peace surrounds you silently. God is very quiet, for there is no conflict in him. It's his peace, capitalized. Conflict is the root of all evil. For being blind, it does not see whom it attacks. Of course, we always think we attack others, or we're attacking ourselves. Yet it always attacks the Son of God, and the Son of God is you. And so when you're attacking your brother or anything in this world, you're attacking the characters in you, the dreamer's dream. And you, the son of God, are dreaming not only of your body mind, but every other body mind. These are your creations, misperceived because they're actually just Christ, the love of God. But because it's filtered through your ego understanding or misperception, you see them as bodies in this world. And so when you attack anyone, okay, you're always attacking yourself, the son of God. And so think about it this way, non-duality. If you attack anyone, you attack yourself. And if you attack yourself, you attack everyone because everyone is a fractured being of yourself, shares its being with you, the holy son of God, the dreamer, and you share your being with God. So by attacking anyone or attacking yourself, you not only attack the Son of God, you also attack God indirectly, or in actual fact, directly because you're part of it. God's Son is indeed in need of comfort, 
or he knows not what he does. He doesn't know he dreams and he believes his dreams are real. Believing his will is not his own. So we believe the script is, is written for us. So we have absolutely no control over it. And in a way, we partly write because the script is being scripted. But the script is you fell asleep and you woke up. Everything in between is a script of the Son of God's dreaming mind. Of course, the Holy Spirit is infused with it and therefore has scripted the individual 8 billion stories in a certain way that it brings us into the remembrance. So what's in the way is the, is the way. The kingdom is his, and yet he wanders homeless. So God's kingdom is ours, and yet we wonder not realizing we actually have never left the kingdom. So we think we're homeless. At home in God, he is lonely, because he's not realizing he's at the home in God. And amid all his brothers, he is friendless. And so even when we have friends, I mean, how do we? How many friends do pe people have that they trust and love completely and see no fault in a single friend? Can you think of a single friend that you cannot find a single fault with as a body mind? Would God let this be real when he did not will to be alone himself? It's the very reason he created us as an extension of himself so that he could share his being with aspects of himself. And if your will is God's, it cannot be true for you because it's not true of God. And so he says to us, oh, my child, if you knew that God wills for you, what God wills for you, your joy would be complete because God only wills you to be complete, whole, and thus happy. What he wills has happened because this dream is just a dream that is over a long time ago. But we're replaying it in our imagination, in God's son's imagination. The dream is playing over because he feels guilty over what he did in his dream. Okay. So what he wills has happened, for it was always true. When the light comes and you have said, God's will is mine. Okay, so that's a decision that you're making. Decision for right-mindedness. You will see such beauty that you will know it is not of you. And remember this, whenever you see a beautiful sunset, sunrise, beautiful landscape, beautiful anything, and the seeking and the chasing and the desire stops and is suspended, that beauty that you're experiencing is actually the beauty, the recognition of our shared being with God. Same place when you travel to a new destination and it's all new and you're looking at the architecture and the landscape and the beauty of a new place. That mind of yours, which in its static environment, in its usual environment, which is constantly beating its up and having the same repetitive thoughts, is suspended for a while. And the knowing of the self rises to the surface or the self rises to the surface. But if you don't know that that happiness you're experiencing is actually the experience of yourself, you attribute the happiness or the ego, your mind, will attribute the, the happiness to the environment, to the landscape, to the new relationship, to the new experience. So next time you're happy and you find yourself in a new place, looking at a piece of art, enjoying beautiful music, and, you've, and you just feel this elation, the rising up of this joyous knowing, this joyous being. It's not an emotion. It's just a knowing of this, this gentle joy rises and bubbles up to the surface. Know that that is your essential self. And don't ascribe it to what you're looking at, because what you're looking at is misperceived anyway. If you could see, see it perfectly with Christ's eyes, what you would be looking upon is not a painting or a landscape or a person. You'd be looking at pure light, the light of awareness, the light which is love. Out of your joy, you will create beauty in his name, in God's name. For your joy could no more be contained than God's. The bleak little world will vanish into nothingness and your heart will be so filled with joy that it'll leap into heaven and into the presence of God. I cannot tell you what this would be like for your heart is not ready. And even if God and Christ told us, we wouldn't understand the closest I can get to explaining it because I have died in this life and I was dead for four hours and I returned to the spirit world, which is still part of the dream but less dualistic, and because of my awareness had been risen to, had raised to such a level 
of non-dual understanding before I died, that I comprehended that what I was looking at, what I thought I was looking upon, realizing I didn't have an eye and a brain. And so I recognized that what I was actually experiencing or thought I was seeing was the extension of myself. And that was the big wake up call for me. And even though it was the first part of the dream, it was so much more beautiful, so much more peaceful, so much more joyful than I've ever experienced in this planet before that. Of course, when I reawoke here, I brought that joyous conscious awareness back with me, meaning in my awareness. I became aware of being that awareness itself. And so if, if that's just the first dream, imagine returning fully awake to the Christ mind, which is beyond um, the access of the, of the first dream, because it's the awake part of the dream. Yet I can tell you and remind you often what God wills for himself, which is perfect joy. He wills for you, which is perfect joy. And what he wills for you is yours because what God wills is done. And that's that wonderful prayer, thy Lord's prayer, thy will be done. The way is not hard, but it is very different, different to what you're used to. Yours, your current ego, body, mind way is the way of pain of which God knows nothing. God knows not of suffering, okay? Because God only knows his holy son as the son which is dreaming. And God doesn't know the individualized contents and activities of his dream. Because if God knew the activities of his dream of body mind, God would make it, it would make it real. So God is simply aware of his son dreaming. God has no idea that you and I actually exist as individual. He knows his son is dreaming. And he's dreaming of a fearful dream. That's it. Hence, the Holy Spirit was created. God extended himself into his son's dream, his voice. And the Holy Spirit becomes the bridge between the dream illusion and God's reality. Why? Because, again, if God knew it, it would make it real and we'd be stuck here. And so the Holy Spirit is the medium between right-minded consciousness of ourself, the right-minded thinking, and god's infinite divine heaven or the kingdom that way is hard indeed and very lonely fear and grief are your guests so remember whenever you're feeling fearful over something it's the ego that is your guest in your mind and they go with you and abide with you on the way so whenever you're afraid of anything realize recognize fear ego whenever you feel the joy god christ the joyous self. But the dark journey is not the way of God's son. Walk in the light, walk in awareness, and do not see the dark companions. What's the dark companions? Egos, people that attack you, people that you attack. Dark thoughts, any grievance is the dark companion, for they are not fit companions for the son of God, who was created out of light and in light. And that's this is alluding to what we really are, if we could be seen a real, like a new prop, we could truly see what we look like and what God looks like. In our understanding, in our conscious understanding, we would just know perfect light, no division between the rays of light. The great light always surrounds you and shines out from you because you are it. How can you see the dark companions in such a light like this? If you see them, it is only because you are denying the light. But deny them instead, for the light is, is here and the way is clear. So again, what is the dark companion? Thoughts of grievance. Any grievance, any attack thoughts that you have, or anyone that you've ascribed attack thoughts to becomes a mirror of your own dark companion mind. God hides nothing from his son. Nothing. Even though his son would hide himself, and that's the reality, is we try to hide from God, like Adam did in the Garden of Gethsemane. Yet the Son of God cannot hide his glory, for God wills him to be glorious. God wants you to be glorious, and gave him the light that shines in him, that is our heart, the, 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 the infinite light of being. You will never lose your way, for God leads you, and he leads you with his voice. When you wonder, you but undertake a journey that is not real. So when you find yourself dark, depressed, sad, 
demotivated, detached, realize you've given the authority of your mind to the ego. The dark companions, the dark way are all illusions. Turn towards the light for the little spark in you. So remember the light, center in the heart. is part of the light, a light so great that it can sweep you out of all darkness forever. For your father is your creator and you are like him. In other words, God is light and so are you. Okay, so this is really bringing us into the awareness of what we are. Our essential self is pure love. And if you could experience it, it would be just un unconditional love, which would just lift you. And if you could see it, because we can't see because there's no eyes to see without body mind, you would just know yourself and the sonship and God as pure light. Okay, And if you could hear it, it would just be the most beautiful symphony that something beyond you've ever you've ever heard okay the children of light cannot abide in darkness and that is us for darkness is not in them do not be perceived deceived by the dark comforters and never let them enter the mind of god's son for they have no place in these temples and dark comforters are the illusions of people places things and events that we pursue in order to comfort us they're illusions they're shadows hence dark comforters when you are tempted to deny God, remember, there are no other gods to place before him and accept his will for you in peace. And what is it to deny God and place other gods before him? It's to place the idea of people, places, things, and events before God. Seek you first to know the kingdom. In other words, seek you first to know God. For you cannot accept it otherwise. Until you know yourself, you cannot accept God because until you know yourself and you know the essential essence, the essential nature of self, you won't recognize the essence or essential nature of God, which is pure light, pure love, pure joy, or what we call bliss. Only God's comforter, that's the Holy Spirit, can comfort you in the quiet, silent, be still and know, of his temple. He waits to give you the peace that is yours. It's not something that you deserve or you're going to inherit. It's what you are. Give his peace to all your siblings, love your creations, that you may enter the temple and find it waiting for you. It's always been there. Where's the temple symbolically? Your heart, you sink into it. But be holy in the presence of God. Be holy, still. Be holy, complete. Or you will not know that you are there. So no judgment. To be holy is to be without judgment. For what is unlike God cannot enter his mind Okay, and enter his mind is enter, be aware that you're entering his mind because you haven't left, because it was not his thought and therefore does not belong to him. Okay, so only when you know yourself will you know God and recognize that you are in God, because whilst you don't know, right now you don't know you're actually in God. Why? Because you don't recognize yourself fully. And yet, if you recognize yourself fully, you would know and not just believe and not just co conceptualize the idea. I abide in God and God abides in me. You would know it with all of yourself. Yourself would be that essence, that joyous essence that knows its connection with, with its source can never be separated, never be divided, never be broken. And your mind must be as pure as is if you would know what belongs to you because what belongs to you is the purity of God's mind. God can carefully temple your heart. Don't allow yourself to be bruised by idolatry, idolatrous ideas, for he himself dwells there and abides in peace. And that's why sink into the heart. And, and this is why in the, even in the Bible, it says God is the peace with which we transcend understanding into knowing. So, you know, God is the peace with which transcendence happens. Of course, the Bible says it's slightly different. Um, the peace that, that transcends understanding. You cannot enter God's presence with the dark companions. And again, remember, you are in God's presence, but you, you're not aware. And so when, when, our re when we reawaken to the self, which is the Holy Son of God, we then appear as if we're returning to God's presence, but we've never left. Okay? So you cannot enter God's presence with the dark companions beside you, but you can also not enter alone. All your brothers must enter with you. For if you, if you have accepted them, sorry, 
for until you have accepted them, you cannot enter. Now, this is a vitally important line that needs to be totally and with total clarity understood. Everyone in the world, again, I, you've heard me say this a few times, but I'm going to repeat. Everyone in the world is an activity in you, the Holy Son of God, the Christ mind's dreaming mind. A part of the mind is awake and remembers itself and remembers God. The rest of the activities, the rest of the body minds of which you experience the world from a localized position. So the dreamer is experiencing the world from 8 billion localized positions. And one of those localized positions is you. But because you've bought into the ego ideas and thoughts, you now believe you're separate. Recognize this in order that you may know yourself. All of it is you. And until you love all of it, including the people that hurt you, bosses, exes, and ex-spouses, ex-relationships, people that have harmed you, until you love them unconditionally, in other words, you accept them as activities in your dreaming mind that were put there as obstacles to peace in order so that you may overcome them. And through the overcoming them, call on God's Holy Spirit, and that you may, through the help and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, you may see the world anew, and you give your the 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 authority of your mind to the Holy Spirit, and you start to see a new world and thus know thyself as that which is the extension of God. And so when you understand that everything that was an obstacle in your way, everything that hurt you or made you feel guilty was there in order that you could transcend fear, guilt, and the idea of sin. And through that transcendence of the idea of sin, guilt, and fear, you could know thyself as eternally pure and never having left God's kingdom. And so the more challenging your life was, the, the, the more you sought to know the truth. And so when you went looking for enlightenment or bliss or whatever you went and looked for, through that pursuit, which is actually the ego pursuing it, because the ego wants to be happy, okay, um, through you. So your body, mind, identity wants to be happy, but never allows itself to be, hence the self-sabotaging, which is one of the ego activities. But the minute it knows itself as that essential essence, which is happiness itself, and is the self, it knows itself as the happiness and love of God. For you cannot understand wholeness unless you are whole. And no part of the son can be excluded if you would know the wholeness of his father. And so all your brothers must enter with you. And that's why the idea that one day you become enlightened and you return to God, and then you just abandon this world, you cannot. Because you cannot abandon the rest of you. A part of you can't return to God. Part of you can awaken and realize it's never left. But all of your siblings need to awaken. And hence it calls you to be a teacher for God. That by sharing your knowing, sharing your joy, sharing your light of awareness, sharing the knowing that you are the self, the Christ, the Holy Son of God, you awaken the rest of your projections. You as the dreamer, taking full ownership of being the dreamer that's asleep in God and has never left, but is dreaming a world and dreaming a universe in his dream. The activities of his dream is called the universe. In your mind, you can accept the whole sonship and bless it with the light your father gave it. it doesn't have to, you don't have to go and individually be friends with all the rapists and murderers and everybody. You just realize there are extensions of the part of you that forgot what it was part of you that was in the darkest dark and so that's what 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 evil or sin or sinners or rapists and murderers and whatever child pornographers and all those horrible things out there in this world what they are are parts of your mind completely asleep and no light is and then they're not aware of the light although the light is still in all of them okay then you will be worthy to dwell in the temple with him why you'll know that you're worthy because you are, because it is your will not to be alone. God blesses his son. So God blesses you forever, both you, the activity of the dream, and that which is dreaming. it. If you would bless him in time, you will be in eternity. Okay? So bless, and so you're blessing God's son in time, not in eternity. But the minute you bless him in time, you immediately go present, because as you bless, you know you're blessed. And the minute you know what you are, you return to the present moment. Here now. Time cannot separate you from God if you use it on behalf of the eternal. And, how, and what is using it on behalf of the eternal? 
is using it on behalf of the eternal joy, peace, and love. You are, for you are the love, the joy, and peace of God. We'll stop there and we'll take some questions. Now we move on to A Course in Miracles text, chapter 11, God or the Ego. And we move to 11.5, the inheritance of God's Son. So this is alluding to your essential nature and and what what you are and what you inherit as the shared being with God, the extension of God's love. So therefore your inheritance. And it's an inheritance. Inheritance is something that you inherit in time, but it really means the unfolding of understanding as you start to realize this is what you are. So it's 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 part of your essential nature, the shared being, your essence. God extends his essence, the essence which is God, energy, and creates you. And so you are created from the same self-essence as that which is God. Can't be created out of something else. Inheritance of God's son. Never forget that the sonship is your salvation. So the sonship is your extension. And what is your extension? Everybody in this world. So everybody in this world, when you see them anew with forgiven eyes of Christ, nothing to forgive, realizing they're just activities in your dreaming mind, you the dreamer's dreaming mind that has dreamt both you and all other localized activities up. When you can accept them all as you, as you mistakenly projecting yourself with different egoic attributes in which Fear, sin, and guilt make itself known. When you forgive yourself for having misperceived yourself, not knowing yourself as the light of awareness, the eternal light of awareness, and having projected yourself in what appears to be space, time, matter, when you forgive that and realize it's all you, you are the dreamer, you are the Christ, you are the son of God, you are the extension of God's love, you are God's kingdom. Then you realize by loving your creation, not avoiding it, not hiding it, not shunning it, not denouncing the world, not rejecting the world, as Buddhists do. Okay, realize it's all an extension of you. Well, the sonship, and there's a couple of mistakes here, and I've, I've highlighted them in purple. That should be a capital S. For the sonship is your self. Self being the Holy Son. So wherever there's a capitalized self, it's talking as you as the Holy Son of God. As God's creation is yours, because you are the extension of God, and belonging to you, it is his. Yourself, capital S, does not need salvation, but your mind needs to learn what salvation is. And what is salvation or awakening or enlightenment? It's the recognition of your shared being, you know, of yourself as the shared being with God. The self is the son of God, who shares his essential nature, his essence, with his Father, God, creator. That's why, again, in certain non-dual circles, people say, oh, this is God's dream, and so when I awaken, I am God. No. Even if this was God's dream, when you awaken, you're the ex extension, the Son of God. Never to be mistaken with source and Son. There's a clear distinction, although there's no separating line because as source is source and it extends its extension is the sonship so you can never be your father although your father created you and it's the wanting to be your father that is the original mistake we made because we wanted our own autonomy and our own authority next chapter explains it quite clearly you are not saved from anything no salvation is required you don't awaken from anything you awaken from having forgotten, but you are saved for glory. So the very essence of you is glory. Glory is your inheritance, the shining radiance of the love of God given you by your creator, capital C, that you might, that you might extend it. And you are still extending it, but you, as you misperceive your extension, you see the misperception of your extension, or you think you see it as time, space, and matter. Yet if you hate part of yourself, all your understanding is lost. 
because you are looking on what God created as yourself without love, because it's your extension. And that's why hiding from the world and beating yourself up and feeling guilty, mea culpa, okay, flagellating yourself as the monks used to, is no way to love your creation. And since what God created is a part of him, you are denying him his place in your own altar, which is what you extend from that which is you. So love your creations. Love, recognize, don't love the egos. Love the essence of what, you, what is in everyone, and everyone is just a projection of that essence, which is you, which is the essence, which is God. Could you try and make God homeless and know that you are at home? Hence, we talk symbolically of the temple or the heart as God's home. Okay. Can the son deny the father without believing that the father has denied him? And this is why we all have that sensation of abandonment. And should anyone in any way leave us for a little moment, that's why children hate being alone, because that built in fierce and guilt, which is projected as abandonment, rejection, and unworthiness, is built into every fractured, misperceived extension activity in the dreamer's mind. Every single fracture feels abandoned, rejected, unworthy, and alien to this place, carries some form of guilt, definitely carries some serious unworthiness, okay? And, of course, is filled with fear because it then needs to appease that which it doesn't even understand or it fears because it's been taught that it's going to burn for eternal damnation. <laughs> the very principles, the, the cornerstone, the keystone of the Bible, eternal damnation. I mean, born in sin. This is bizarre. How can you mean born in sin? What created you? God created you. Why would God create you sinful? And then we love Dante's Inferno. So we are now the fallen angels. That's another school. It's where we fell. We fought against God. We be, and Satan we fought against God and Satan became evil. How can that which is made from God, the angel of light, Lucifer, Lucifer, Lucifer who came to earth, angel of light, become evil? If it's made from love, where on earth did it discover evil? Oh, evil is the absence of love. Well, how can it be absent of love if it's made from love? It's all nonsense. The Bible is just full of nonsense. God's laws hold only for, for your protection, and they never hold in vain. What you experience when you deny the Father is still for your protection, for the power of your will cannot be lessened without the intervention of God against it. And any limitation on your power is not the will of God, because God has willed you to be fully powerful and extend like he does, because you are his extension. Now, from a dualistic point of view, if you still believe in, and you're still trapped in old Christian beliefs, that is immediately blasphemous. How dare you say you're the son of God, first of all? How dare you say you're one with Jesus, like Jesus? And how dare you even say you're the son? Okay. And how dare you say that you are the extension of God's love, because that makes you all powerful. And therefore, as God extended you, so you extend. How dare you? They want you to believe in God hierarchy, the son who died for your sin. Children, so God has one son, something floating up there, which is his Holy Spirit. No one really understands it. They get, they get very angry when you try and ascribe any form of quality to the Holy Spirit. Because when you say Holy Spirit is your essence, the memory of God in you, oh, no, no, how dare you? The Holy Spirit, how dare you equate yourself to that? They love this. Christians love to attack this. Okay, And then God is a son and then children. But surely if I'm a man, I'm a son too. No, 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 you're children. Mm. And so he's created us with sin, original sin. Why? We have that good old book, even though it's Judaic and it's not Christian, but we hang on to the old book because the original sin was Adam. Okay, And of course, man couldn't sin. So a rib was taken and, and created Eve and she went and ate the fucking apple, spoke to the snake. And now there's an original sin. Now they fell. And because Adam and Eve created all of us, even though now we must all be siblings, because well, now we're all mad because one creates two. And now there's, you know, so the two of them, now there's Adam and Eve, and they have two sons. Mm. One kills the other. Now there's only three of them. 
And all of a sudden, that one guy goes out and breeds with whom? Who did, who did, you know, if Cain killed Abel, who did Cain go and breed with that we're now the descendants of? Where did the rest of them appear from? Bible can't explain it. And of course, we won't go there because it's all symbolic. Oh, so then were there other people on this earth? So if there were other people on this earth and it was Adam and Eve that sinned, how are we born in an original sin? No, that doesn't make any sense. But no, we're born in sin. So God creates us and makes us sinful. God creates us and then puts an, a tree with an apple or whatever the fruit was, because we're not sure if it was an apple. No. Christians would love to argue it's not an apple. Okay, it was a pomegranate. In fact, it could have been a banana. It had to be a banana. Surely Eve would have eaten a banana. Funny fruit. And I create us all sinful. So God, which is love and without sin, creates beings that are sinful. And then expects them to worship him. And if they don't, burn in eternal hell. But he sent his son to die the most horrific death so that we may be forgiven. If we believe in the son, because the son is God. Because there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So three in one God. Why couldn't there just be one God? No, because Jesus is the extension of God, and now he's holy. The whole thing is absurd. And they'll argue it in the blue in the face, and they'll attack non-duality, and they'll attack A Course in Miracles. And, of course, the Bible will say, be careful the false prophets that come in my name. Nice escape clause. So just in case anyone ever contradicted with it, I made sure the scribes put it in there. But, of course, the scribes were influenced by, by the Holy Spirit. Not that we can be, only back then, 2,000 years ago, could you be influenced by the Holy Spirit. And of course, if you belong to a church, then you can be influenced by the Holy Spirit. As for the rest of us, we're just sinners. We're all sinners. And the idea that we're dreaming and that there is no sin, which frees us through the practice of forgiveness, which is also a cornerstone and foundation of the Bible. Forgiveness sets us free. I seek mercy, not sacrifice. Forgive. Forgive that you may be free. Love your brother as you love yourself which is what the Course teaches, although that's inspired by Satan. This is a false demon pretending to be Jesus, talking to Helen Schuchman. Helen, who lived in integrity, didn't want to really influence the Course, was so torn because a part of her knew the Course off by hand, but she didn't want to believe it, and she didn't want to believe it. Why? Because it would then throw a whole world upside down, and she wanted to hang on to her sexuality, her femininity. She was torn and she was open and in her integrity about it. And they attack that. And she was torn because she knew as soon as she wrote it and as soon as it got out there, man would turn it into some form of cult and some form of religion and they would fight with each other. And she saw the infighting. Don't attack the book. In the same way you could attack the Bible. It started as one, Christianity, Roman Catholic Church, 20,000 sects of Christianity, all attacking each other. And it's often the Catholics that get all defensive and attack non-duality. Never mind all the shit that happens in the Catholic Church. The Crusades, the countless murders done in, the, in, in Christ's name under the banner of, of the Pope and the Catholic Church. Oh, no, don't go there. Never mind that they're great teachers like Meister Eckhart of the 1200s, 12th century. The beautiful non-duality that he, that he taught. Of course, they tried to nail him, but he was declared and non-guilty. They don't go there. They want to attack this. And this is the problem with trying to move into a non-dual understanding because our fundamental society and our laws and our customs and our norms, which is Western society, is grounded on the fundamental premise of Christianity because laws become beliefs, okay? And beliefs become laws. And, and the more you reinforce them, the more you believe them, and eventually they're legal. And it becomes the cornerstone of our value systems. And it's so difficult because the idea of forgiving horrible people, oh, no, they're sinners. They're going to be punished. How does that make you feel? And so, therefore, and it says here, therefore, look only to the power, only to the power that God gave to save you, the power of the Christ, the power of love, remembering that it is yours because it is his and you're an extension of God. You're the children of God. You're the extension. You're the sonship. 
and joining with your brothers in his peace. And throw all that dualistic nonsense away. The Bible is filled with beautiful truths, the teachings of Jesus. But of course, when written and interpreted with a dualistic, separatist, right, wrong, good, bad, evil, love, separation, mind, you're going to misinterpret. And as the scribes that couldn't understand Jesus, those that wrote the Bible, seven books, books of Paul, who hated and persecuted the Christians, and when he realized couldn't beat them, better join them. The foundations of the New Testament, Paul's books. are steeped in duality and the misunderstanding of our shared extension and love of Christ. Jesus loved his brotherhood completely, unconditionally, and tried to teach us to do the same. And when we try to follow in his footsteps and be like him, now we blaspheme. But as long as we worship him, adore him, sacrifice for him, build churches, make money, where the ministers and the priests are wealthy and beyond the, the subjects that are giving their little coins are starving, but the churches are growing and charismatic movements and making millions and I'll pray for you and hands on healings of the mind. And I've seen miracles. Witnessed it through my own experience. But it's not by my hands. It's by God's Holy Spirit, which resides in all of us as us, as the, as the memory of God in all of us, the memory of the Son of God in all of us. Your peace lies in its limitlessness. Limit the peace you share and yourself, shared being, must be unknown to you. Every altar to God is part of you. And the sonship is the altar to God because the light he created is one with him and therefore in all of us. Would you cut off a brother from the light that is yours? Would you not? You would not do so if you realized that you can darken only your own mind. And as you project your hatred and your your anger and, and your attack thoughts onto them, it's all in you. So you forgive to be released of it as you bring him back. So you will return. That is the law of one. That is the law of God, the immutable law of God, law of one for the protection of wholeness of his son, you, a dreamer. Only you can deprive yourself of anything and you have, and your attack thoughts have created your attack experiences. Your unworthy thoughts became attack thoughts towards yourself. Your abandonment thoughts became attack thoughts. Your rejection thoughts of yourself became your attack thoughts. And as a consequence to that, the world demonstrated what you believed about yourself in people, places, things, and events. And because you first thought it and didn't realize you did, the world then attacked you, rejected you, abandoned you, didn't love you, didn't accept you, rejected you, abandoned you, denied you. Lied to you. Why? Because you lied to yourself. You abandoned yourself. You rejected yourself. You saw yourself as unworthy. And so the world reflected it. And you don't realize you first thought it up. You misperceived that which you are. Projected it outwards through your eyes. God is the light with which you see. With those eyes, you see your projections, your misperceived, misrepresented projections. And so you are the camera projecting. And the world reflects your projector. And you attack it. And it attacks you because you've attacked yourself. Only you can deprive yourself of anything and everything. Do not oppose this realization. For it is truly the beginning of the dawn of light. The, the light of Christ returning to your mind. Remember also that the denial of this simple fact takes on many forms. And these you must learn to recognize. And to oppose steadfastly without exception. So when you attack a brother, you're attacking yourself. When you attack yourself, you attack your brotherhood. Because there's only one dreamer. And although you think you're localized as this individual, separate from all else, 
you the dreaming son of God. You're projecting all 8 billion of us. And then you see yourself in 8 billion localized fractured parts. And you can't put the total, total picture together. And yet, if you return to the Christ mind, Christ mind recognizes the entire universe is in its mind. And its mind is in God. And as God extends the light, which is the sun, the sun extends the light. And that's the light in you, the joy in you, the Christ in you, calling you to return to the Christ mind. Not Jesus as a man. Christ Jesus as the awakened son of God, calling us all to return to heaven. This is a crucial step in the reawakening. The beginning phases of this reversal are quite painful. And you hear a lot of people, they get so far with the course, they've done it for many years. Of course, they would teach as many of them. And then they just give it all up. And, and like the little Doreen virtues of the world that once upon a time made millions, became famous because of her little angel books and all the lies she told about angels. And now she's given her life to Jesus in the Christian church. And what does she do now? Now she attacks any non-dual teaching, including the Course in Miracles, and makes YouTube videos of it. Never bothered to read the book. Of course, she claims she has. Probably did the, the workbook, as they all do. <laughs> you know, if you've done, I've done the course. No, you don't do the course. A course is a life. You open this book and you do it for the rest of your life. You never put it down again. It becomes a continuous forgiveness process where you start to remember yourself. Okay. And so the beginning of, of phases of these reversal are quite painful and you'll be attacked by the dualists. You'll be attacked by people that don't understand. How can there not be sin? How can we not hold grudges? How can we not go and invade another country because of the infidels? For as blame is withdrawn from without, there is a strong tendency to harbor it within. You read that again and please pay close attention to this. So, you know, sons of God, remember this, teachers for God. The beginning phases of this reversal of thought, of awareness, are quite painful. Yes, they are. Don't give up. For as blame is withdrawn from without, so you stop blaming the world. What happens? Now you attack yourself for having dreamt this whole thing up. Whether you attack the outside or you attack the inside, if you attack the external, you attack the Son of God. You attack the internal, you attack the Son of God. It's all the Son of God. It is difficult at first to realize that this is the exact same thing. For there is no distinction between within and without. It's all one. If your brothers are a part of you and you blame them for your deprivation, you are blaming yourself because you don't realize they're projections of you. And you cannot blame yourself without blaming them. That is why blame and attack thoughts and grievances must be undone and not seen elsewhere nor inside you. Lay it to yourself and you cannot know yourself. And the ego would love you to do that because the ego either wants you to be a bully and attack the world or a victim and be attacked by the world. It covers its base on both sides. So neither a bully nor victim be. For only the ego blames at all. Self-blame is therefore ego identification and as much as an ego defense as blaming others. You cannot enter God's presence in the awareness of God if you attack his son. His son and his sonship. When his son lifts his voice in praise of his creator, he will hear the voice for his father, the voice of God, the Holy Spirit. Yet the creator cannot be praised without his son, for their glory is shared, and they are glorified together because they awaken as one. Christ is at God's altar in your heart and in God's mind, waiting to welcome his son, but come holy without condemnation. For otherwise, and this is, and of course, in the Bible, so it'll be sin. Non-duality, condemnation, attack, attack thoughts, both of self and others. For otherwise, you will believe that the door is barred and you cannot enter. And it's barred because you won't recognize it's right in front of you, within you. The door is not barred, and it's impossible that you cannot enter the place where God would have you be. But love yourself with the love of Christ, unconditional acceptance of what is. For so does your Father love you. 
love yourself with the love of Christ. It's why he came and demonstrated death, resurrection, ascension, so that you could know you can do it too. You can refuse to enter, but you cannot bar the door that Christ holds open. Come unto me who, who holds it open for you. For while I, while I live, it cannot be shut, and I live forever, the eternal Holy Son of God. God is my life and yours. God, in essence, is the life, which is the essence of what you are, not this body-mind, which is a temporal projection, a temporal disillusionment, a temporal hallucination of what you are. If you could see yourself with the eyes of Christ, you would just know infinite, eternal, blissful, joyful, loving light everywhere. You would know where the Father starts and where you begin. It's just the extension of a shared being. You share your essence with God, and nothing is denied by God to his son. God loves you unconditionally, no conditions. A God of love cannot condemn. A God of love cannot judge. That which judges is the son of God dreaming, unaware that he's never left his kingdom's home, his father's kingdom. At God's altar, Christ awaits for the restoration of himself in you. Heart, mind, not the brain. The awareness moves right-mindedness. The heart is filled with the awareness of Holy Spirit, and it fills the mind. I'm using it symbolically. And the mind then knows itself as the mind of Christ, the mind of the Son of God, temporarily dreaming. And it awakens to capital S self. Now you've only moved halfway. Now you pull back into the world, and you share the light of your newfound awareness. The awareness that has been in place and held for you since time began. Because this dream was over long ago. It's just replaying in your mind because you haven't forgiven the guilt. God knows his son. God knows you as the dreamer. As holy, blameless as himself. And he is approached through the appreciation of his son. Gratitude brings about the awareness of the essence of what gratitude comes from, which is love. Gratitude is love. Christ waits for your acceptance of him as yourself. Of course, to the Bible punches, this will be blasphemous. How dare you? And of his wholeness as yours. And where has Christianity got you? Where's duality got you? And then you got to a place where it said there must be another way. You didn't give up on God. You didn't give up on Christ. You didn't even give up on Jesus. You didn't give up on the Holy Spirit. You gave up on the church because the church was the darkest and is the darkest of the darkest mind. Church is blasphemy. Religion is blasphemy. The Bible is blasphemy. Satan is ego. And, of course, the church will have you believe that the, the greatest lie the devil ever told is it doesn't exist. Has anyone ever seen the devil? Anyone ever in the time? Anyone ever taken a picture, recorded it? Oh, he acted like he was the devil himself. Just talking ego. And when Christ met with the Satan in the, in, in the garden of Gethsemane while he meditated and prayed and said, you can have the whole, call down your angels. You can have all of this. Who's he talking to? Who was recording it? Oh, he told the story afterwards. It was a conversation in his mind. The ego attack thoughts try to attack Christ too. And Christ Jesus, Christ Jesus knew the ego. He was aware of the mind and how the mind was twisted and was attacking it. He knew he was a character in his own dreaming mind. And he awoke to becoming that awareness that he is the dreamer dreaming all, however many millions were on the planet at the time. And he said, get away from me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. In other words, ego, I'm not giving you any attention. Okay. For Christ is the son of God who lives in his creator and shines with his glory. Christ is the extension of love and the loveliness and beauty and joy of God, as perfect as his creator and at peace with him. If you'll only accept Christ, like in, in old du in duality, accept Christ in you. Non-duality, accept Christ as you and you as Christ. Join with the office of the Christ mind. 
that you can know yourself as the Holy Son of God. One with Christ, no, one with Christ, one with God. In duality, oh, no, you join Christ and you play with Christ and then you'll both be seated at the right hand of the Father as if the Father's got a right hand. One with Christ, where do you start and where does Christ begin? One with is one. One with, non-duality. Blessed is the Son of God whose radiance is of his Father and whose glory he wills to share as his Father shares it with him. There is no condemnation in the Son, no judgment. There's no condemnation in the Father. Sharing the perfect love of the Father and the Son must share what belongs to him. For otherwise, he will not know the Father or the Son himself. Peace be unto you who rest in God. And I really mean this. Whenever you're weary, whenever you're troubled, be still and know. Sink symbolically into the heart. Invite the memory of God into you, the Holy Spirit. Invite the Christ into you and abide in that silence and let silence and peace become you, become your essential essence, become your essential nature. Return to the love of God's son. Return to the memory of the love God has for you, the eternal non-judgmental memory. You have not sinned. You've dreamt you've sinned. But an unconditionally loving God does not judge. As a man judges, so he will be judged. By whom? By his own judgmental thoughts, not by God's. Because unconditional love is unconditional. God is not dualistic, no matter what book says what. Because those books that were written in antiquity, no matter how much they loved God and they were influenced by God's mind, they were limited by their understanding of self. They weren't written in hatred. They weren't written to confuse us and to punish us. Man took those books and turned them into hateful practices and hateful churches and hateful religions, all about money and power. Remember, the church were the governments of old and still influence governments today. They did, but they didn't do it out of hatred and malice. Men did, but those that wrote the books did it with the kindness they could find in their hearts. They genuinely loved Jesus. They genuinely loved the Christ. They genuinely loved God, but they misunderstood themselves in relationship to the Christ and God. Remember yourself, remember God. Remember yourself as the self, as the same self essence, the shared Christ. You share the office of the Christ. You join with the office. You become one son of God. And when you remember yourself, you know yourself as the love and light, pure light, which is creation. And as you extend the light and love, you are. The sonship becomes one. Peace be unto you who rest in God. Abide in God. And in and whom the whole sonship rests. Amen. Let's stop there and uh, we'll take some questions. And now we get on to A Course in Miracles, text chapter 11, God or the Ego, and we do um, 11.6, the dynamics of the ego. And so this section really explains the treachery and the behavior of the fallen mind, the, the mind that's filled with fear, sin, and guilt, the mind which that projected this universe, because it's the, the, the Son of God is always extending. But when misperceived, it's then seen as a projection. And that projection appears in time, space as matter. But even in quantum, quantum science, quantum physics, quantum, um, quantum studies, quantum physics studies, as scientists dissect matter and they start dissecting further, further they realize there's nothing. So even what appears to matter is just vibrations of tiny little particles that when even looked within even smaller, those little particles disappear. We realize that matter is just energy vibrating. And as we start to realize the, the true essential nature of non-duality, what appears to be matter exists in consciousness. Nothing that is matter has consciousness. 
It's the appearance of a projection of consciousness that appears as matter in space and time. But even as space and time is an illusion because we're always in eternity here now, that which appears as matter is the light of awareness, the light of the self, the light of the Christ. The dynamics of the ego, no one can escape from illusion unless he looks at them like quantum physics. And they're now noticing, but it's what appeared to be solid. It's just particles moving. And when you try and weigh those particles, there's nothing. They just dissolve in the light of awareness. For not looking is the way they are protected. And that's what the ego tries to do. It doesn't want you to pay too close attention because then you realize the illusion. There is no need to shrink from illusion. For they cannot be dangerous if they're nothing. We already look more closely at the ego's thought system because together we have the lamp, the light of awareness that will dispel it, the memory of God, the voice for God. And since you realize you don't want it, why? Because no matter what you've done by pursuing people, places, things, and events, the obstacles to peace of the, the illusion, you were unhappy. And so when you said there must be another way and you surrender to what is, and you ask the mind of Christ, the light of the Holy Spirit to enter you, you must be ready. The dynamics of the ego will be our lesson for a while. For we must look first at this to see beyond it. You must see it, dissect it, and realize it never actually exists. Since you've made it real, and now you need to see it truthfully, we will undo this error quietly together and then look beyond it to the truth. What is healing but the removal of all that stands in the way of knowledge? Be thyself knowing you. And how else can one dispel illusions except by looking at them directly without protecting them? Empty the cup. Don't go looking based on what you believe it is. Empty the cup completely. Do not be afraid. Don't be afraid of what you're going to see because you, what you'll see is not there. What you thought you'd see is not there. Be not afraid, therefore, for what you will be looking at is the source of fear. And you are beginning to learn that fear is not real. What's the acronym for fear? Future expectations appearing real or future events appearing real. You are also learning that its effects can be dispelled merely by denying their reality because their reality isn't true. The next step is obviously to recognize that that, sorry, recognize that what has no effects does not exist. Remember, thoughts leave not the mind that thought them up. And so what we see is the effect of an unhealed mind. When the mind heals, what do we see? A healed self. Laws do not operate in a vacuum. And what leads to nothing has not happened and cannot happen because it leads to nothing. If reality is recognized by its extension, God, what leads to nothing could not be real. The beginning of the book, nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. Herein lies the peace of God. Do not be afraid then to look upon fear, for it cannot be seen. Try and find fear, and all you'll find is thought that made you fearful. Try and find those thoughts, and you'll realize they're fleeting. They come and go. What comes and goes is impermanent. If it's not permanent, it's not real. Clarity undoes confusion by definition. And to look upon darkness through light must dispel it. Let us begin this lesson in ego dynamics by understanding that the term itself does not mean anything. It contains a very contradiction in terms, making it meaningless. Dynamics implies the power to do something. And the whole separation fallacy lies in the belief that ego has the power to do anything. The ego is fearful to you because you believe this, and yet the ego has no power to do anything. Yet the very truth is very simple. All power is of God. What is not of God, what is not of him, has no power to do anything. 
because the only thing that is real is God and, and the extension of God, the sun. When we look at the ego, then we are not considering dynamics, but delusions. You can surely regard the delusional system without fear, for it can't, cannot have any effects if its source is not real. So fear has actually no source. It's just an error in the awareness of what self actually is. It's a temporal glitch in our awareness of self. Fear becomes more obviously inappropriate if you recognize the ego's goal, which is so clearly senseless that any effort on its behalf is necessarily expended on nothing. The closer you look to it, the closer you realize it's just a tiny little error, an error based in fear, sin, guilt. And when you get rid of the error and realize that what dreams cannot sin, has no fear, and therefore cannot be guilty, no matter what you dream isn't real, the Son of God remains as God created him, eternally unchanged, forever free. The ego's goal is quite explicit, explicitly ego autonomy. It wants to be in charge of itself. It doesn't want any authority, yet it wants to have authority over you. From the beginning, then, its purpose is to separate, sufficient unto itself and independent of any power except its own. This is why it is the symbol of separation. So ego means separation. And so when you see yourself separate from your brothers, you are seeing with the ego's foundation thought system. Every idea is a purpose. And its purpose is always the natural outcome of what it is. We teach that which we are, or that we teach that which we think we are. Everything that stems from the ego is the natural outcome of its central belief. And the way to undo its results is merely to recognize that their source is not natural, being out of accord with your true nature, which is the same nature as your source, unconditional love. I said before that to will contrary to God is wishful thinking and not real willing. So to make manifest is not to will like God. And yet we ask God to help us make manifest. And what does making manifest do? It just creates more obstacles to peace, to the knowing of ourself. And yet when you surrender and allow God to provide and completely trust God to provide, and have total faith in that which is your source, you'll have everything that you ever wanted to manifest and more. But you'll have everything that serves in the highlighting and the continuous reminder of the loving essence as the extension of God that you are. Everything else you manifest in your will, because remember, you have the will to manifest because you have the power of God, even though you have the power of God in the dream, you're manifesting. We call that law of attraction. The law of God is the law of reciprocity. Reciprocity and attraction are two different things because you attract what you are. And if you're still an ego, seeing yourself separate, you're going to attract stuff that keeps you separate. You're going to attract people and relationships that will trigger your, your sense of unworthiness. If you, if you reject yourself and you hate yourself and don't like yourself, you don't believe you're worthy, you're going to attract people that will remind you that you are those things you think you are. And things will fail and things will, and jobs will fail and, and relationships, because everything's a relationship where people, places, things, and events will fail because of your belief about yourself will be your relationship with everything you have in this world. Given to God, he gives you everything and reminds you as he gives you everything that you've ever wanted, okay, without chasing after it, everything becomes a reflection and a mirror of your holy self. An error here with will. And it should be capitalized. God's will is one. Okay, and that's a capital one as well. Because the extension of his will cannot be unlike itself. So God extends the essence of himself, unconditional love. The real conflict you experience then is between the ego's idle wishes and the will of God. Which is why we get so upset when our wishes, what we wish for, doesn't come true. And then we think God has abandoned us. The very reason those things we wish for don't come true is because God knows they're just going to become further obstacles to peace. Okay. 
So the ego's idol wishes in God, God, the will of God, what you share. And can this really be conflict when you're wishing and willing and, and hoping for illusions and God is giving you often the, 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 the disappointment in not having them. And yet when you, when you really look closely, what are you disappointed at? Not having more illusions. Yours is the independence of creation, not of autonomy. You cannot be autonomous from God. You cannot have independence from God because now we're back in duality. It's the very reason we're dreaming. We wanted to make a whole world for ourselves to disprove God had any power over us. And because we wanted that, we created it because God gave us free will and the power to create. And so what do we create? A misperceived projection of ourselves. Your whole creative function lies in your complete dependence of God. And yet you believe that you can create without dependence of God, whose function he shares with you because you are his function. By his willingness to share it, he became as dependent on you as you're on him. Why? Because he shared himself with you and therefore shares himself as you, with you, for you. Do not ascribe the ego's arrogance to him. And we have. Bible is filled with it. Religious books are filled with it. Vengeful God, jealous God, demanding God, a God that takes sides, a God that insists on going to war. I mean, he creates all these people and then takes a side. And then go and bomb the shit out of some small nation, march around their temple, blow a trumpet, destroy the village and the, and the city with children, innocent or not, women, children, old people, destroy them. Because he's taken your side and you're God's chosen nation. God doesn't choose sides. God is on the inside of everyone. And everyone is inside God. It's not whose side is God on. It's who's on God's side or inside God in the awareness of. Do not ascribe the ego's arrogance to him. I mean, the whole world's filled with this. Who wills not to be independent of you. God wills to be joined with you. He has included you in his autonomy. Can you believe that autonomy is meaningful apart from him? Thank God that you're not outside God, because if it was up to you and your own thinking, your own thoughts by now would have murdered you at least once a week. The belief in ego autonomy is costing you the knowledge of your dependence on God. Be fully dependent on the very life force you are, which is God itself in which your freedom lies, and your joy lies there too. Freedom is joy. Joy is freedom. The ego sees all dependency as threatening and as twisted, even your longing for God into a means of establishing itself. Religion, hateful religion, dogmatic religion, judgmental religion. But do not be deceived by its interpretation of your conflict, because your conflict is actually with that which is not true. And you want to stop giving any attention and conflict to that which isn't true and focus all your attention on the light of Christ. Call on Jesus and ask him symbolically, Jesus, the Christ, call him, show me another way to see this. Call on God's memory, God's Holy Spirit, show me another way to see this. Show me another way to know myself as the extension of God's love. Remind me that I am love. I am the love of God. The ego always attacks on behalf of separation. Look at all the wars in the world, all driven by the idea and the desire for autonomy, control, authority, and us and them. And we look for a myriad of reasons to divide race, color, creed, nationality, sex, and the subdivisions of it, beliefs. It will find anything to separate. Believing it has the power to do this, it does nothing else, just more and more separation. Seek and do not find, because its goal of autonomy is nothing else. The ego is totally confused about reality. It does not know reality. It does not know God. But it does not lose sight of its goal. It is much more vigilant than you are. It's an active attack thought system that never stops. Even in your awakening, it will still tempt you. 
And one of the mistakes people do, and that's why they give up on the course, they say, but this insistent ego doesn't stop. It won't. Even when you're awake, the great teachers like Ramana Maharshi, Jesus, even on the cross, nailed to the cross, ego attacked. And he forgot for a second, forgive him, Father, for they know not what they do. There's no one to forgive. And then he realized, he said, it is done. Okay. Because it is perfectly certain of its purpose. And its purpose is to keep us divided. You are confused because you do not recognize your purpose. And your purpose, and the only reason for incarnation, in which is part of the dream activities, first dream into second dream, is to come and know yourself through the experience of what you're not. In Advita, it's called the neti neti. I'm not this, I'm not this, I'm not this, I'm not this. I must be that. Return to the remembrance and ask Holy Spirit to guide you. Don't try and do it on your own. Christ has come before us to demonstrate crucifixion, resurrection, ascension through a horrific thing called crucifixion so that we wouldn't have to be crucified again, not symbolically, not physically. He's done it. and He's ascended it. He's transcended body. The dissolving of the body was the ascension. What appeared to be floating up in the clouds was just disappearing, disappeared from sight because there's no need for the body. Christ mind is alive and one with God, consciously aware it's never left the kingdom. The part of the mind that knows the rest of the mind is dreaming, the part of the mind that calls the rest of the dream activities, part of the mind to return to awakened awareness, Christ mind. And of course, the biblical books don't want you to do this because they ego wants us to keep the Savior outside, worshiping, trying to appease. And through trying to appease this vengeful God, trying to appease everyone else and serve because I'm better than and I forgive you because I'm better than. That is all ego. You must recognize that the last thing the ego wishes is you to realize that, it, that you are afraid of it. For if the ego could give rise to fear, it would diminish your independence and weaken your power. Yet it's one claim to your allegiance is that it can give you power. Law of attraction. Okay. Very spiritual law of attraction. Let's manifest. Visualize. Vision boards. Make more. Grab more. More, more, more. Oh, I'm so happy I have it. Oh, I'm unhappy again. More, more, more. Not recognized. The happiness is the minute the search stops, ego stops, the mind quiet. The minute the mind quietens, the self is revealed. Self's always there, but it's hidden between the desire of acquiring, pursuing, searching for. Search stops, the happiness is made known. And the ego immediately says, No, 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 no. You're happy because you've acquired it. No. The next time you're happy, remember, it's the self. The happiness is the awareness of self. Hang on to that. Hold on to that. Recognize that. Abide in that. And give gratitude to God for revealing your happiness as yourself. Happiness is the essence. is your shared experience with the shared being, which is you, the son of God. Okay. So yet... The ego's claim is your one power to its legions is that it can give you power. Without this belief, you would not listen at all because you've attracted. The ego's given you skills and, and education and titles and lessons and stature and posture and, 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 and attractiveness and all the stuff that, oh, look at me, and then takes away. Beautiful person gets older. People stop admiring. Oh, ego's got you again. How then? Can its existence continue if you realize that by accepting it, you are belittling yourself and depriving yourself of true power? The ego can and does allow you to regard yourself as super, supercilious. Uh, okay. Supercilious, okay. meaning arrogant, unbelieving, lighthearted, distant, emotionally shallow. Callous, uninvolved, and even desperate, very desperate, but not really afraid. We hate it, but we're afraid. Minimizing, minimizing fear, but not its undoing, is the ego's constant effort 
and it is indeed a skill at which it is very ingenious. How can it preach separation without upholding it through fear? And would you listen to it if you recognize this is what it is doing? Okay. Do not listen to those thoughts. Your recognition that whatever seems to separate you from God is only fear. Because what's the distance between you and, our, you and your heart? What's the distance between you and love? Regardless of the form it takes and quite apart from how the ego wants you to experience it is therefore the basic ego threat. It, it wants you to be loving, but only to get. It wants you to be loving, but only control. And that which it calls loving is attraction, desire, the need to acquire control own. God's love is unconditional. Love between two people is absent of two people. Love is the absence of body. Love is the absence of two. That's why Christ says, where two of you are gathered in my name, there I shall be also. What happens to the two of you? You dissolve in the light of Christ's awareness. Okay. True love is unconditional and there's no bodies involved. It's the awareness of our essential nature shared with God. Ego, it's a dream of autonomy, separation, independence, is shaken to its foundation by this awareness. When you're aware of being aware, you realize you are awareness itself. No body needed, no fear required. Because if you're not a body, where's the fear? But though you may countenance a false idea of independence, you will not accept the cost of fear if you recognize what it is. It's just a false idea. Yet this is the cost, and the ego cannot minimize it. If you overlook love, you are overlooking you, yourself. For you are the love of God. And you must fear unreality because you have denied yourself. If you recognize yourself as love and as the love of God, what would you fear? The very essence of you is love. Does the light fear the shadow? Is there even a shadow when there's light? Only if there's obstacles which prevent light from shining through. And what is an obstacle? A temporal illusion. By believing that you have successfully attacked truth, you are believing that attack has power because you believe in what you have made and you believe you're going to be punished. Very simply there, you have become afraid of yourself and no one wants to find what he believes would destroy him because you believe you're guilty. You believe you're filled with sin and even the good books want you to believe that you're a sinner. And the only reason that you'll go to and go to heaven is because you believe in the son of God. What happens if you just believe in God? No, no, no. You have to believe in the son. Okay. But surely if God is God and the son is God too, then just by believing in God, it's enough. No, no, no. You died for your sins, which means now you belong to this clan. So the Christian clan, even though we have 20,000 sects, and none of them agree with any of them. They all badmouth each other's stick. And they even badmouth the original Christian church, the Catholic one. And the Catholic attacks everybody else because they're the original one. Therefore, they must be right. Never mind the atrocities, all the shit the priests have gotten up to, all the stuff the churches have done, the crusades, the murdering, going to other countries to invade them and convert them, even if it means murdering women, children, and innocents. Oh, no, 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 that was then. Now they're all holy all of a sudden. Yeah, right. Mm. old men with funny hats and funny robes. And... Ay, 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 ay. and then all these new charismatics and they're all just wealthy and building massive churches, 5,000 people, and hundreds of ministers and hands on and hallelujah and give your tithing, join the church and 10% has to go because God needs your money. It's all ridiculous. And then they, then they try to make you feel guilty. Well, they certainly can only make you feel guilty if you believe in their dogma. If you throw their dogma and their book out the window and you're simply not interested, no matter what they tell you, you're going to hell. No, no, no. I'm in hell listening to you. Listening to you is hell. I just rebuke that nonsense. The Bible, the church, all of that nonsense, I rebuke it. It is blasphemous. I listen to Christ and Christ alone. I listen to God's holy voice, which is our inheritance. 
And if you believe only you, the special ones are allowed that, well, I'm not interested. Christ in me, I in Christ. I abide in God, God abides in me. I abide in Christ, Christ abides in me. And God's Holy Spirit brings us together and reminds us, I am his Holy Son. What you can do, I can do. And greater things than I have done, you shall do. All you require is the faith of the mustard seed. The Father's in me, I am in the Father. And if the Father's in me, the Father's in you. It's just, just history. If the ego's goal of autonomy could be accomplished, God's purpose could be defeated. And this is impossible. What does the ego want you to do? You're a sinner. You're unworthy. Okay. Give your life to Jesus. Jesus doesn't want your life. Jesus knows your life. And Jesus knows you're a shared life with him. Jesus wants your love because he wants you to love all brothers as he loves all brothers. That's why he brought us those two commandments. Love the Lord God your, with all your heart, with all your mind, with everything you have. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. But it means you have to love yourself too. Love your neighbor unconditionally as God loves you. Only by learning what fear is can you finally learn to distinguish the possible from the impossible and the false from the true. No matter what good book said what, throw all that dogma away. According to the ego's teachings, its goal can be accomplished and God's purpose cannot. What is God's purpose? Love. Simply love. According to the Holy Spirit's teachings, only God's purpose can be accomplished and is already accomplished. Of course, no, no, no. The good old dogma wants us to believe that in the final judgment, and we should be taken up into heaven. Where's heaven? In your heart. Where are you going to be taken up? There's no up. There's no down. In non-duality, there's only here now. God is as dependent on you as you are on him. Now, what this means is he's not dependent on you as a body-mind, but he loves his son, and he wants his son to know him as love because his autonomy encompasses yours and therefore is incomplete with your without 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 it meaning with your without your awareness that you are because god would only be happy when his son knows his happiness himself it's not that god is unhappy and god can't be god without us it's just that god loves us and as those of you that are parents know you're unhappy when your child's unhappy when your child is sad or sick you're unhappy why because you want your child to be restored to health so it's not that the, the God needs us in terms of our power. He wants us to be happy because he's a loving God. He's a loving father. And that's symbolically. It's just pure essence, pure energy. You can only establish your autonomy by identifying with him because your autonomy is God's and fulfilling your function as it exists in truth, which is to extend the love of God. The ego believes that to accomplish its goal is happiness, but it is given to you to know that God's function is yours and happiness cannot be found apart from your joint will with God. Recognize only that the ego's recognizing only that the ego's goal, which you have pursued so diligently, diligently throughout your dualistic life has merely brought you fear because others can attack you others and you not recognizing it's all in your mind. And when you love that, all of it loves you back. And it becomes difficult to maintain that fear is happiness. We get so lost in translation, we get so lost in searching, we eventually become so disillusioned, we become unhappy again. Upheld by fear, this is what the ego would have you believe. Yet God's son is not insane and cannot believe. Let him but recognize it and he will not accept it. For only the insane would choose fear in the place of love. And what do old dualistic traditions teach us? Beliefs. Fear. Fear. Fear God. Fear this. Fear that. Fear the devil. Fear everything. Oh, fear. And only the insane could believe that love can be gained by the attack. Righteous victories and righteous anger leads to righteous justice. And oh, they can take this and attribute all sorts of righteous angers to God. Just amazing how the church has completely skewed the loving teachings of Jesus the Christ who came to show us, and that's what it means by walk in my footsteps, be like Christ, be like him, try to be like him, love unconditionally. 
But the sane realized that only attack could produce fear, from which the love of God completely protects them. The ego analyzes, the Holy Spirit accepts. Ego analyzes what? The fractured selves, the dream act activities, good, bad, right, wrong, anima, animus, 34 personality types, blah, 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 blah. Divine, 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 segment, segment, attack, attack, attack. The appreciation of wholeness comes only through acceptance, for to analyze means to break down or to separate out. I know, I've studied it, masters in it, I'm a master in strategy and the segmentation of the human behavioral psychology. The attempt to understand totality by breaking it down is clearly the characteristic contradictory approach of the ego to everything. The ego believes that power, understanding, and truth lie in separation, segment, cross-analyze, put it in compartments, keep it apart. And to establish fear, it must it establish this belief, it must attack the belief in fear, the belief in separation. Unaware that the belief cannot be established and obsessed with the conviction that separation is salvation. The ego attacks everything it perceives by breaking it into small disconnected parts. And then those small disconnected parts beat themselves up, attack themselves, or attack the world. And as they attack the world, they attack themselves. And as they attack themselves, they attack the world. As they attack themselves, the world seems to attack them. As they attack the world, they seem to be attacked by the world, trapped in that loop. Defend, attack, defend, attack. Never to end, never without war. Lots of people say, but, ah, oh, you know, the good old days, things were much better. We had a better sense of self, a better sense of nation, a better, what? For whom? For those that were the victors? What about the slaves? Do you have a better sense of self, autonomy, but you had slaves? What about those people suffering? Now we have equality, equality of rights. We even want equality of outcome. The equality of outcome woke society is the recognition of our shared being. Not the equality of fractured ego body minds. You'll never have equality of fractured ego bodies minds made by a fearful mind filled with sin, fear, and guilt. It's designed to create inequality, racism, discrimination, sexism. The ego is creating it and will propagate it and will do it through races and nations and countries and division. Now we have the Russians attacking the They were once one nation. Find a difference and attack. As soon as you find it, find another difference. Look for another reason. Now we woke. Once it was gay rights. Before that it was woman rights. Now it's woke rights. Transgender. 36 different variations of. What is it that we're all crying for? To recognize, to be loved equally, but not as body mind. You can't love illusions equally because none of them are equal and that which loves isn't love anyway true love is the recognition of our shared being and if we all recognize our shared being first of all the entire universe would dissolve because we remember ourselves as the son of god but let's say temporarily the dream would continue for a couple of moments more we would love each other unconditionally there would be no fear because there'd be no fear it would only be love. And when there's only love, shadows, fear, dissolve in the light of love awareness. And it wouldn't matter what you were trying to be. It wouldn't matter what sex you are. It wouldn't matter what you gendered and transgendered into. It wouldn't matter because you wouldn't trans anything. You would just know that you're not a body. I am free. And who, what wants to transgender? That which believes it's a body and believes it should be another body. And then wants to be seen as a separate body, as another body. I want to be seen as a bat, Batman. Because he always gets the car and chicks dig the car. That's a line from the second movie. Oh, you, I want you to recognize me as Batman. And if you don't, I'll be insulted and you're a bigot. What is that? That is just crying for love. Not recognizing it is love. If they love themselves, the world will see them in the same light but while you reject yourself you think the world rejects you 
And while the world rejects you, you reject yourself, not realizing it's the same thing. And so we want to, it perceives everything by breaking it into small disconnected parts without meaningful relationships and therefore without meaning. Because remember, everything is relate I on a ship. We're on a ship heading home. And how do you relate to yourselves? With judgment? Look at the, what was once the greatest nation in the world. And they can't even agree on two divided camps. Ego loves it. Ego loves it. The ego will always substitute chaos for meaning. For if separation is salvation, harmony is a threat. And that's the last thing. Will there ever be peace in this world? For a tiny instant between, before it dissolves into the light of awareness. And until then, while the ego wants us to be separated, while we believe in body-mind, While we don't recognize ourselves as pure light, as long as there's a material, physical world, there will never be peace. Because the very fact that there's matter perceived as a material, physical world in space time, there is no peace. When we dissolve the idea of space time and matter, we will know ourselves as the peaceful, loving, eternal joy and extension of the love of God. And that's the only peace it'll ever be. The ego's interpretation of the laws of perception are and would have to be the exact opposite of the Holy Spirit. The ego focuses on error, sin, fear, guilt, and overlooks truth, the light of awareness. It makes real every mistake it perceives. And with characteristically circular reasoning, Urumbus comes back and bites itself in the bum, concludes that because of the mistake, of the mistake, consistent truth must be meaningless. Okay, so it loves to make mistakes real and then says, well, because the mistakes are real, the truth must be meaningless. <laughs> See how silly it is? Whoop, bum. Whoop, bum. Bite itself in the bum. The next step then is obvious. If consistent truth is meaningless, inconsistency must be true. And man, does the ego love that. And then we want the consistency the, of outcome. We want the equality of outcome, knowing full well that because it's created 8 billion inconsistently separate different characters, each one with varying levels of degrees of intelligence, desire, drive, blah, 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 it won't be. And then we have a reason that we get them to attack each other, demanding equality. And let's repeat the past. And of course, any discrimination of any form, especially racism and sexism and whateverism, is disgusting. It's ego. But bringing it back up now and trying to change the past, you change the past by simply becoming present. There's no past. And then bringing that love of, of light of Christ and sharing it going forward, never to repeat the history again and never to allow it to ever happen because it's pure evil in the sense that it is pure ego. Because what is racism and discrimination and sexism but lack of love and separation and segregation and superiority and wanting to be autonomous and control others? Never again to be repeated. Let's not bring it up and make ourselves feel guilty again for it. Let's forgive. We never do it again. Let's acknowledge the suffering of those that came before us as ourselves, that went through the horrors of racism, discrimination, sexism, and honor those that walked through it and brought the light, sometimes through their sacrifice, unnecessarily, unnecessary sacrifice, but through their courage brought the light and brought us into a new understanding of our shared being. Let's not punish each other for what happened. There's a part that goes, oh, the feminine God. We, the feminine God descends, the feminine. The fe God's neither feminine or masculine. Just because mankind messed it up and masculine, 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 patriarchal God, don't go the opposite now and go the feminine. It's just God. God is all there is. And God is neither feminine nor masculine or God is both. And it's all one. 
Don't now start. You're not going to bring balance by taking it the pendulum to the other side. The very fact that the pendulum swings is no balance. Center. Center in the awareness. In extend the love you are. Don't repeat the atrocities. Bring it into the light of awareness. Don't try and change the history. Learn from it. Recognize how evil and how dark and without love it was, never to be repeated again. Holding error clearly in the mind and protecting what it has made real. Repeating history. The ego proceeds to the next step in the thought system. Error is real and truth is error. And so it just keeps us in this perpetual blame, attack, blame, attack, repeat. Blame, attack, repeat. Blame, attack, repeat. Let it go. Move forward. In the light of forgiveness, the light of awareness. Don't do it again. But let go. Move forward. Remember, Holy Son of God, who and what you are and where you've never left. The ego makes no attempt to understand this. It doesn't want it. And convinces people that they're right and they're being righteous. And that the grace of God, fierce grace, gives us righteous anger. That's ego. There's no fierce grace. It's loving grace. It may appear fierce to the ego who wants its own, its own autonomy in its own way. But God isn't fear. The resistance to love, that's fear. That's fierce. Grace is love. Where's fierce in love? And where's righteous anger? Righteous is forgiveness. Everyone deserves to be forgiven because nothing we've done is real. Dualism, ego, very clever. And it uses the church beautifully to keep you in perpetual punishment and attack and defend and attack and defend. And it is clearly not understandable, but the ego does make every attempt to demonstrate it. And this it does constantly. Ego has appropriated all spiritual beliefs and all religious beliefs and has used it to attack. Analyzing to attack meaning, the ego succeeds in overlooking it and is left with a series of fragmented perceptions, which it unifies on behalf of itself because by keeping them fragmented and unifying it in the name of righteousness and justice, we then have two parts believing that they justified attacking one another and what is it that both sides really want to recognize the love they are and to be the love and when the minute you are love there goes all the fear the ego wants you to believe you're guilty sinful unworthy but hey someone saves you someone died tell me does that relieve your suffering well now you want to go and force it down everybody else's throats this is the light. This is the truth. And you're lost. This then becomes the universe it perceives. And the universe, which in turn becomes a demonstration of its own reality. And then we say God created it. Unless he sends a meteor. And wipes out the dinosaurs and mankind. Oh, then maybe it was the devil that sent the... Maybe it was the devil. And then immediately, all reason goes out the window. Do not underestimate the appeal of the ego's demonstrations to those who would listen. And it uses religion and, and, and even God very carefully in its own way. Selective perception chooses its witnesses carefully. Like I say, the ego very quickly misappropriates um, spiritual understanding, conscious understanding, turns into magic or love understanding and turns it into religion and dogma and fear-based religion. And its witnesses are consistent. And you can find it beautifully in every good book, Quran, the Vedas, Egyptian book of the Dead, all the books and of antiquity. There they are. Buddhism, denounce. Taoism, avoid at all costs. Don't engage. Vendantas, other than the Upanishad. God is dreaming. God wants to know himself through you. God doesn't dream. God is. Love doesn't dream. That which forgot, which it's love, it is love, dreams. 
Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Trinity. And then the canon father somewhere down there below. Brahman, Vishnu, Shiva. And everybody else. The memory becomes images and statues. Meant to be there to hold us in consciousness and the recognition. Mother Mary, Joseph, those that brought Jesus in the world and took care of that which brought through the message, the Messiah, the memory of love. Next thing, the statue gets worshipped. Brahman, Vishnu, Shiva, same thing. Atman. The monkey god, Unaman. Next thing, it's monkeys. We lose it. The ego is so clever. And that's why be careful that it doesn't grab your understanding and turns it into dogma and fear or specialness the other way. The case for insanity is strong to the insane. Magic. Ooh, Reiki. Ayahuasca. Ooh, oh, I, oh, look at me. Oh, I had a glimpse. If you don't recognize the self, you could be as high as a kite and you wouldn't be any of the wise. Oh, we're with the earth and we're all the children of the earth. We're in the hugging forests and, and we want to save mother nature and save. And we're with the trees and the leaves and we sing and we dance. And we, of course, we're going to get high too. We tattoo our bodies with mandalas and we're just so earthy and we wear earthy clothes and we don't wash our hair. We, of course, drive old BW combis because that's fucking hippie. But no, the world is terrible and fucking global warming and global cooling and global whatever the hell. And now we're one with the earth, our earth children. You're not one with anything. You're one with God. What do you think made the earth? Who do you think made the forests and the trees and the mountains? The very essence of God's love in the dreamer's mind allowed creation to happen. Everything is an echo for the memory of God. Oh, but we don't mention God anymore. The universe will provide. The universe is in your mind. The Son of God, the essence of God's love, provide. The universe is a delusion of a dreaming mind that forgot what it is. It doesn't provide for anything. The memory of God in us, the voice for God, God's Holy Spirit, that provides. But no, we're afraid of saying God because the church fucked it up. So instead of saying the church, the dogma messed it up, the ego's dogma under the guise of God and religion fucked it up properly. We give up on God, the universe. Ooh, the universe. Oh, Jupiter's now retrograde up your anus. And the Palladians are coming as star children and the indigo. Who makes up this shit, ego? Holy Son of God, remember yourself, remember your Father. For reasoning ends at its beginning, and no thought system transcends its source. Yet reasoning without meaning cannot demonstrate anything, and those who are convinced by it, by it must be deluded. You can hire Washka and join with the earth. If you don't know the essence of your shared being, you know nothing. And you can write beautiful songs and feel the love. But if you don't know what you are, you are going to return so that you can remember by the experience of remembering what you are through the experience of what you're not. If you don't give the recognition of your shared being to that which is our God and the love that is the energy of everything in creation, you will return so that you can remember yourself the Christ mind, the son of God you are, and thus remember your father. You cannot remember God until you remember yourself. And until you invite the memory of God, God's voice, God's Holy Spirit, into that which you appear to be, the self will not be revealed. The very essence, which is your shared essence with God, the essential nature, your purest essential nature, unconditional love, which is the reminder of God's essential nature, unconditional love. And until you know the self, you cannot know the Father. Because until you know the self, you don't know the Son, which is the Christ, which is the extension of God's love. 
Can the ego teach truly when it overlooks the truth? Can it perceive what it is denied? The ego looks straight at the father and does not see him. Why? Because the ego is an illusion and cannot see reality. Illusion cannot see God, for it is denied his son, which is that which temporarily is asleep, looking. The ego is the forgotten part of the son and therefore cannot know the part which remembers the father, the Christ. It comes up with a myriad of ideas of what is spiritual and what is holy and what is religious. Be thyself authentically. All you need to do is remember the essence. I'm going to make you all holy and spiritual and smiley, smiley all day long. You don't have to wear a robe, shave your hair, boom, chicky, boom, face east, or oh, meditate, silence. Meditation is simply a practice to get you to recognize thought, not mind. Behind me, ego. Behind me, Satan. Satan. Would you remember your father? Of course you would. It's why you're here. And accept his son and the sonship equally. And you will remember him. Because his son, the myriad of projections you, the dreamer, is having. When you accept them as that which is in your mind, the misperceived misprojected essence which is love when you know that is love you know this is love and this dissolves and the awareness of being aware yourself comes into its own awareness the moth reaches the flame and joins with the flame as a big where's the moth now it's gone only the flame of the holy spirit uniting you with your father nothing can demonstrate that his son is unworthy nothing for nothing can prove that a lie is true. What you see of his son through the eyes of the ego is a demonstration that his son does not exist. Body minds have come to this dry and terrible wilderness to die. In the hope that one day they'll return to a place they've imagined. But if you're returning to a place you've imagined, surely you should remember the place that you want to return to. And when you truly know yourself, you'll know where you come from. You'll know your source and you'll know that you've never left because it's prevalent in your present awareness. Be here now. Be as you are. Remember yourself. Holy son of God. Yet where the son is, the father must be. Accept what God does not deny and it will demonstrate its truth. The witness for God stands in his light and behold what he created. Their silence is a sign that they have beheld God's son. And in the presence of Christ, they need to demonstrate nothing. You don't need to explain this to anyone. Hence, no comments on these YouTube posts, because I'm not interested in listening to some onward Christian soldier onward, off to war. Go fuck yourself. For Christ speaks to them of himself and of his father. They are silent because Christ speaks to them. And his words, they speak. And it is his words they speak. And I am here to appease Christians. I give a shit. I've listened to your shit for 2,000 years, never again. And if you're offended, it's about time. <laughs> if you don't want to be offended, listen to David Hoffmeister. He is Beautiful. He is as close to Christ as it gets. This one came with a different agenda because different agendas are required. Every brother you meet becomes a witness for Christ or for the ego. Choose. Choose again. Every brother. Think of all the people that hurt you. Mother, father, spouses, girlfriends, husbands, wives. Does he witness Christ? Or does he witness your ego? Not their ego. Because everyone, every relationship is triggering what you are. Not, oh, look at them. They were horrible. They cheated. They lied. They... No, no, no. You believed you were unworthy. You were beating yourself up. You were cheating your righteousness. You were unworthy. And so they demonstrated it. So are they witnessing Christ in you or your ego in you? Not are they egos or are they Christ? What do they witness to? Witnesses you, mirror. They're your mirror. 
depending on, on what you perceive in him. Everyone convinces you of what you want to perceive. Read that again. Everyone convinces you of what you want to perceive. And so to some people, I am sent by the devil because they want someone to prove that their righteous belief is true. And therefore, I'm fighting them for their religion. Hang on to your religion. It's amazing how Christians all think everybody is out to kill their religion. No one gives a shit. It's only Christians attacking other religions and now lose attacking them too. And just just having fun because I'm just mirroring. So if you want me to be the Satan, then I'm your Satan. That's okay. But it's you that sees Satan in you. And now you see me as that projection of, oh, no, no, we don't like non-duality. So hang on to your duality, hang on to your religion and be happy with it. But don't try and convert me. Why do you need to convert me? Because you don't believe what you believe. Oh, no, you want to save my soul. Really? You know my soul? You don't know your own soul. You don't remember where you came before you came into this existence. How do you know where you go? You believe because the book says. But if you can't remember, why would you believe? Why would you believe in something you can't remember? No proof on. Just because some old man wrote it 2,000 years ago. I ain't interested in your shit. So everyone convinces you what you want to perceive and of the reality of the kingdom you have chosen for your vigilance. You choose. Everything you perceive is a witness to the thought system you want to be true. So if you want to believe in the devil, believe in the devil. It's true for you then. And of course, you're going to see demons and every possessions everywhere. Fun. I just see ego men and women losing their shit, getting drunk, getting high, and acting out their fear. Still I haven't seen the devil. You. Every brother has the power to release you. Every brother. If you choose to be free, you cannot escape false witnesses of him unless you have evoked false witnesses against him in your mind. If he speaks not of Christ to you, you spoke not of Christ to him. Everyone you see in the world, lost sheep and happy sheep and awake sheep and sleeping sheep and vicious sheep and Hitler sheep and, and bad sheep and good sheep. All in your mind. And when they awaken, the essence of everything you see is Christ, the Son of God, the extension of God's love, extending eternally like God does. But because it's asleep, that extension is misperceived and appears as a universe of space-time matter. But when seen anew with the mind of Christ, you will know yourself as the light and love of God. And you will see your extensions. The universe dissolves matter, space, time. And there is only the love and light of God. Yes, it's a concession in my limited understanding of the essence of what God is perceived through this body mind. Trying to remember itself and wanting to share the love of God with all of you. That's the best I can do. I know it's a concession. But this is my joyous expression and my joyous knowing. And I love having a good dig at those that don't. But I do it loving, even if you're offended. You will hear but your own voice. And if Christ speaks through you, you will hear him. Because he is the voice which speaks through you, joined with the Holy Spirit. They become your temple. They become your heart. They become your guiding light that you may remember yourself and remember your father and know that everything you see will dissolve the light of your Christ mind awareness. Amen to that. Hope this has brought some clarity for you. Um, we're going to stop here tonight. We will continue on Sunday. Yes, I will return on Sunday and we are going to do the, three, the last part of Text chapter 11 on Sunday. We'll do Waking to Redemption, which really brings us into the reality of, um, and I mean, I love this part. I'll just, it's impossible not to believe what you see, but equally impossible to see what you do not believe. Blessed are those who believe, but have not seen. Just another way of 
interpreting that beautiful line by Jesus in, in the New Testament. The conditions of reality, which means love, and the problem and answer, which means the Holy Spirit. I'll stop there and thank you for joining me and look forward to meeting and seeing with you and, and sharing this Christ time with you on Sunday.